I'm Dr. Martin Rutherford. I'm a certified functional medicine practitioner and a chiropractor. Dr. Randall Gates, board certified chiropractic neurologist, also a chiropractor. And today we're going to do the next in our series of uh, no BS type of presentations, and this one is on Lyme disease. And uh, Lyme disease is something that we have treated for quite some time now. And it was kind of an interesting evolution as to how we got there. We're actually not trying to be as controversial as the title might seem, but the reality is, is Lyme disease seems to create great passion, not only in the patients who have been diagnosed with it, but also the doctors who have, um, who have kind of taken hold of it, the Lyme literate community, and come up with uh, certain uh, procedures that uh, that are being used today as, as standardized procedures. We're going to talk about that at great length, but I thought it might be interesting for you briefly to under, know how we got into it. We didn't. We did. Doug Gates is a certified functional, board certified functional chiropractic neurologist. I'm in functional medicine. The two of them are different disciplines. We melded them to treat dizziness, vertigo, balance, migraines, concussions, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue. Um, peripheral neuropathy, and those last three for sure, as you know, are frequently diagnosed with, at, with Lyme. So we were really delving into those conditions, and I, I don't think I'd be exaggerating if I said probably close to half of the patients who came in here had been diagnosed with Lyme disease as the cause of their fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue and their peripheral neuropathies. Mm -hmm. We were uh, very upfront with those patients and said, we don't treat Lyme. <laughs> we don't really like know a whole lot about it. We just know that you have a lot of symptoms that we're treating in people who have fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue and peripherality that are getting better. And we'd love to treat you to see what happens. At the time, we were still evolving our understandings of what we were doing and how to put what we were doing together. And so in the end, we started having a lot of Lyme patients' symptoms resolve or let's say substantially improve and or resolve with what we were doing. So we started uh, to talk um, more about what might be happening relative to um, what types of things that we were treating that could be resolving the symptoms of a bacterial infection with co-infections. And uh, that's kind of where it took off. Doug Gates started to do a lot of more specific research on it. And that's kind of how we got here. So we're, gonna, we're, we're sharing this with you. And, 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 and we try to be sensitive about it. We understand this is a sensitive situation. We don't want to be cavalier about it. But there appears to be a much maybe more efficient and effective and, and certainly cost-effective way to go about these things than maybe is the standard procedure out there. Now, Dr. Gates, maybe you could tell them why this is probably going to take longer than the maybe seven or eight or 10 or 15 minute presentations that you see on, online, uh, why they should stick around and listen to uh, what we're gonna uh, have to say here. I would say now based on the current research and the way that Lyme disease has come to fruition, that there's never been a more exciting time for Lyme disease for Lyme sufferers. The reason why is that as many of you know, many of you are disenfranchised, you feel neglected by the medical community, you feel that maybe there was a fission, so to speak, between the standard infectious disease community and then the doctors who understand what you're going through who are referred to as the Lyme literate medical doctors. Not to say either side was right or wrong, but because of the argument between the two, it seems as though by chance a solution has been come up with, frankly, in the literature. And that's that most of you have an immune problem Many of you think of it as immune suppression. That's not entirely incorrect. But the fact of the matter is that most of you have autoimmune issues, autoimmune problems. And so many of you feel that you have neuroborreliosis, which is where the Lyme disease affects the brain. But I'll talk to you about current literature that shows that it's really the autoimmune issue in your body that's causing your brain not to work right, for you to be fatigued and not be able to think and have widespread pain. And so <clears throat> from all that literature, it's just, I've never been so excited about Lyme disease because we're helping people by addressing their immune system, potentially so people don't have to be on antibiotics for years and years and years. We're not saying there's not a time for antibiotics, but really we think that we need to direct our focus more towards the immune system than the bacteria. 
and Dr. Gates will share with you the science and the techniques that we have evolved. We, we've evolved some pretty cutting edge techniques for fibromyalgia and chronic, chronic fatigue, fatigue. Yeah. Uh, and that's what led to this. So I, I, I humbly say we've developed some pretty cutting edge techniques for this, for the Lyme thing. And Dr. Gates will share with you about why some people get Lyme and why some people don't. Why, why the people who get it are usually compromised hosts already. I think that'll illuminate a number of things. I think you will talk about the controversies over the, uh, over the testing mm -hmm. and maybe even some concepts as to where the testing might need to go. Um, we'll talk certainly about the types of procedures that we use that we find are effective and uh, the, how stress responses are involved, how autoimmunity is involved, how gut, affects, how gut is involved, and, and, and where the co-infections and the bacteria and uh, bacterial infections so on actually ought, do matter, maybe where they do respond, and then mm. once that doesn't work, then why it's off to the races and how you can avoid that. Would that be fair to say? That's fair to say. Okay. And we have a very special guest today. We, we, we've never done this before. We're going to do it today because uh, our patient, Elizabeth, is going to be with us. And what we do in these series is, is we also try to help you to understand how we do our consultation because usually it's anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour long. And it's very important to us to know what was compromised in you. What was your entire history from the time you were born, literally, until you were infected. Um, these all give us hints as to how to go about your case, but, uh, but so many of our patients come from the Lyme literate doctors, and of course, when they get to us, they're in horrendous condition because it hasn't worked, or they wouldn't come to us, okay? And so, Elizabeth wasn't as in, in as bad condition as other patients who came here. Actually, she was quite a bit better going through the Lyme literate procedures, but she has a number of interesting observations relative to that. And, 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 it was really, and it was really helpful for us because she didn't come in here for Lyme, again. <laughs> so, so she didn't come in here for Lyme. So, so this is kind of an interesting perspective for the Lyme sufferer who is, is out there to see. And then uh, we'll walk through that. Elizabeth will get to tell you her experience. I don't know that I've met any Lyme patient who's been through the whole gamut of the Lyme literate procedures and then the procedures that we're developing and, and, and who could give you a better really truly accurate and, and from the heart kind of understanding of, of what she went through. And, and, and what I think you're going to find is if you are a Lyme sufferer, you're going to find that somewhere in that story is going to be you, unless I miss my guess. So we're going to go through what we do as a consult, how we kind of go through the consult very, very briefly. And then I'm going to do kind of a sort of a consult on Elizabeth that's going to allow you to see how our patients are interviewed, but more hear her whole story. So that's, I think, where we're at right now. Uh, we'll probably cut over here and, 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 and do the um, consult. And, uh, and then we'll, after that, go to uh, what I think, I think you need to stick around for. I think there's going to be some, um, some very, very up-to-the-minute illuminating research on Lyme, what it is, the variations of it, what it responds to, when it doesn't respond, why it doesn't respond, and what types of things uh, are go, going to help that you to be able to maybe get off of that plateau that Elizabeth was on before she got here. So we're going to walk through uh, a consult with you, but, but a little differently than, than normally I would do it in, the, in other presentations that we've done, or a little bit differently than we actually do it uh, when the patient is sitting here. Uh, because uh, we're, we're going we're gonna to have Elizabeth expand upon her experience and her stories. But the Lyme patient does, for me, require uh, a different type of consultation. When we're doing a consultation on chronic pain, what we have found in, let's say, fibromyalgia, peripheral neuropathy, chronic fatigue, what we have found is, is that there are certain basic elements that have compromised that patient's physiology before whatever trigger has set them off, whether it's an infection, whether it's a stress, whether it's a trauma, a surgery, having a child. These are triggers that our patients daily come in here and say, I was fine until this happened, and then everything was horrible. And the reason that happens that way is because um, the patient was already compromised. So the history usually starts back like even at birth, if that's what's necessary, or the patient might say, you know, I got a bad gut when I was in third grade, 
or I started feeling bad when I was in high school and then bring me towards that. Uh, so it might be that the patient had, had problems in high school, but it might not be that they really triggered it until they were 33 years old when they had their second or third child or whatever. So, so we try to cover that. Uh, and, then when we, and, then, and then when we get to the part of the line, that is where I kind of deviate from my uh, other normal consults. Because the Lyme patient that arrives here generally has failed in, in, in their other attempts, or in Elizabeth's case, improved, uh, uh, I think, to a large degree, but still she can tell you where she was when she plateaued. And so that patient has been well schooled in the Babesia and the co-infections. Um, Dr. Horowitz is here. I, I have his book sitting right behind me. I've read it so that I can be prepared for the questions that I'm going to get. And Dr. Horowitz's book, uh, for those of you who don't know, he's kind of considered the authority on Lyme. Uh, the first third of his book talks about the bacteria, the infections, the the co-infections, the different types of antibiotics, the different pulsing uh, types of uh, procedures and the or different orders in which you do them in. And it's, um, it's, it's quite comprehensive. And I noticed at the end of that, he said, but most patients don't respond to this, which was kind of interesting. I, I gave him a lot of credit for that integrity. And then he says, if you don't respond to that, then it's off to the races. Then we have to look for, and, and that's the last two thirds of his book. And I, I, so patients are pretty well schooled in that by the time they get here. And so what I learned as time went on was at the point where it started to feel like this patient would be a good candidate for our program, I needed to just stop right there and say, look, here's what you need to understand. We don't look at it that way. Once you haven't responded to the antibiotic therapy or possibly some of the other therapies, here's what we see is going on. And, and, and here's what the literature has come to recently support and here's how we look at it. And it's as Dr. Gates said, we look at it as an autoimmune problem in a compromised toast. We have to take care of the things that had compromised that patient before they had the infection and triggered off the uh, Lyme response and frankly triggered off numerous either uh, uh, numerous autoimmune problems or a, even exacerbated ones that were there and or uh, created new ones. So there, there are all those probabilities. And I do that because the Lyme literate patient is Lyme literate. And so a lot of times if I can't help that person understand that there might be another way that might be more efficient, I know they're going to be insecure. I know they're going to be not as good a, a candidate for what we do. I know they might even quietly go home and sabotage what we do because they can't let go of what they already know. And so that's something that, that I do with that patient. I don't do that with a chronic fatigue patient. I don't do that with a fibromyalgia patient or anybody else. It's just because the Lyme patient is so uh, schooled in it and clings to it. And I'm not being facetious by any means, trust me, because it concerns me when I hear that, when the, when the patient is so well schooled in it. So we try to kind of disengage that, and Elizabeth may be able to speak to that to some degree in how we're going to walk through this. And then I'll go on with the rest of the console. Okay, what happened from the time you were infected on? Who did you see? What did you try? And, and what worked and what didn't work? And then that all helps us to really decide, is that patient a properly selected patient for what we're going to do? Meaning, if we examine them, if we come up with what we understand to be the, the perpetuating factors of this condition, uh, if we uh, recommend care and, and they go through care, is it going to work? And, and, and we have very, very few failures in the properly selected patient, meaning that most of our patients will get usually substantial improvement. Some, some will actually have all of their symptoms go away. Uh, for the most part, you're going to have a, a, an, an autoimmune problem if we're right, and I think we are, because this is what we've been doing for a long time now. And that's something that needs to be controlled, but in the end, that's a very doable thing. You can, you can, and you can control it in much simpler means than what you have maybe been educated on, uh, uh, based on our experience, based on our results, and so on and so forth. So what I'm gonna do is uh, I'm just gonna now take advantage of the fact that Elizabeth consented to do this and, um, and just kind of walk through this now. This is going to give you a lot more data 
than I'm usually asking for from a patient that I'm just trying to uh, evaluate and, 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 and qualify. Uh, and, and, and so, um, so she's going to have kind of a free reign here to answer these <laughs> questions the way that she'd like to. And uh, because she's very passionate about this, she feels like she wants you to know everything that she's experienced and, and, and it comes from the heart, believe me. And uh, so, so we'll, let's walk through what a patient who has been through virtually, in my observation, every single aspect of Lyme disease, not only suffering, but protocols, uh, the, 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 the Lyme literate protocols, the protocols that, we, that, that we've developed. And, 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 and so somewhere in there, maybe some of you can grab a nugget that says that makes sense to me, or I, I, I relate to that, or, or maybe there's something else I can do, or, or, or things of that nature. Or maybe I think these people are crazy, <laughs> or whatever. But, uh, but in the end, uh, I, I think you're gonna find this very interesting. So, so pretty much, uh, why don't you start with how it started, and, and, and kind of tell us your story. Um, what was it like when you hit bottom, um, and 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 then uh, you know what did you do, you know, and, and then maybe we'll we'll kind of go from there. Okay. So um, I started having symptoms when I was 14 years old. I was in middle school, and um, my mysterious symptom. Everyone with Lyme knows that we don't start the same. Nobody has the same symptoms. There are 200 plus symptoms that a Lyme person can have. And my weird symptom that I would Google all the time is, because it didn't make sense, was pain in my back. So much so that it would be hard for me to wear clothing. Um, I wouldn't be able to hug people. It was actually painful. So I had some social, I distanced myself socially because I didn't like that. Um, it, because it was painful, especially in middle and high school. So that was um, definitely a really hard thing for me to overcome, but I just, was like, well, this is just a weird thing about me. I'll wear double layers of shirts. I'll just overcome it. Um, and over time, that pain began to take over my back. So it was very small to begin with. And then it started creeping as years went on over my entire back and started spreading forward to my front. So um, I had pain, what I would describe as shingles, but without the rash all the time. And it just kept growing. And um, there's no answers for Google for that. There's nobody to say, oh, this is Lyme disease. And so it took me a really long time to find a doctor to figure out what was going on with me. I saw pretty much every doctor um, in the Reno Tahoe area that would see me. Um, and I didn't get very many answers. In fact, I was put down by them or said, you need therapy or you need other things. And yeah, very that, common. Yeah, that didn't really help me. So um, I, I felt ostracized, I felt cast out, I felt like I didn't belong. And then I had my family who was doing the best that they could. They didn't know that I was different than a teenager. They thought that my excessive sleeping or um, some of the other symptoms that I had, that they just chalked that up to being a teenager. Yeah. <laughs> and poor not, teenagers get blamed for everything. Yeah, not that I was getting more and more sick. So by the time I was 21, I had a doctor tell me, like, just live your life the best that you can. You should never have children because of how many medications we have you on. And um, that broke my heart a lot. And so I went and I sat with my parents and I said, here's what this last doctor told me. Um, and I, of course I'm crying and I'm emotional because nobody likes to hear that as a 21 year old woman that you would never be able to have children. Right. Um, and so my family was like, we're gonna figure out an answer. And they started really expanding where we were searching for answers from. And I was going to any alternative doctor, any anyone, um, I never heard of Power Health at that time. I don't, I don't even know. Um, we may not have known what we were doing yeah. at that time. <laughs> yeah. So um, anyway, I found a doctor who actually had Lyme disease herself. And she looked at me, was very kind, and she said, I think you have Lyme disease. And that was a powerful moment to me because all of a sudden my symptoms had a name. There was a name behind whatever. I had no idea what Lyme disease was. I thought it came from the Lyme that gets in a shower. Oh. <laughs> Um, so I had a, a big learning curve ahead of me, and that doctor started me on antibiotics almost immediately, and I tanked. Um, I couldn't get out of bed. I lost 10 pounds in about a week. Um, I, my body reacted severely to these antibiotics. So from there, um, my life kind of 
took a tailspin and I started, I wanted to get into a real Lyme literate doctor instead of just this regular mm -hmm. practitioner who mm -hmm. knew of Lyme and had it herself but wasn't prepared to treat right. the severity of my Lyme disease. Um, and in there that, are different severities. Right. And I was really bad. I was actually put on palliative care for a little while because they didn't know what to do with me. And um, I, it, was a, it was a very scary time. I wasn't sure if I was going to live through it. I was sleeping 22 hours a day. I was not okay. Um, and so I did. I found a great Lyme literate doctor in the Bay Area. And um, I started treating with him for many years. So understand, we're not saying there's no such thing as Lyme and we're not right. bagging Lyme literate doctors. Right. Okay. They, I mean, without my relationship with my Lyme literate doctor, I don't know that I would still be alive. Do I have regrets of the order of treatment that I did knowing what I know now? Absolutely. I wish I would have done it different, but given the path that I took, I'm very grateful for my Lyme literate doctor. Um, so I couldn't do uh, IV, I couldn't do uh, oral antibiotics. I had to do IV antibiotics. So I went through seven pick lines and then I got a port um, and I would do IV antibiotics around the clock. I was on everything. For a long time, I was on 90 different medications and that's multiple medications every day. That's similar to what a lot of people with Lyme disease are going through. Yeah, um, I hear it all the time Yeah, in the histories. So that's kind of where my story started um, and what my treatment was like. After four and a half years, roughly, my doctor said, be free and fly. You're done with your treatment here. So, so you, were, you went from thinking you were going to die to where? So, so, Because so you did improve through I, those treatments. I did. Oh, I can expand on that. So each year I kind of got better. The very first year I was uh, sleeping 24 hours a day. I was chronically nauseous. Um, I spent a lot of time in bed. And then um, this is, it's still emotional because it hasn't been that long out for me. Um, so year one, I lived with my family. They care take, they were my caretakers. Um, year two, I started integrating a little bit more independence. So I was still on IV antibiotics. Um, I was, the goal for me was to get to the hyperbaric chamber. So I was slowly adding different things in. I would see uh, different naturopaths and different things who would put me on supplements and other, other protocols. And, um, I basically did everything that you could imagine. Um, that was basically the point I wanted to bring yeah. out. So it's, I think, I think one of the things now I got into what I do because I had fibromyalgia, peripheropathy, chronic fatigue. It's not an accident that, that, that I'm here. And so I kind of went through the same thing, mm -hmm. but nobody told me I had Lyme. It's amazing because I'm from New Jersey. I was yeah. picking ticks off of me my entire childhood and I never tested for it and I've never tested for it since, but, but the, but the experience is similar. Mm -hmm. And, and what I got was, and, and what, what, I, what I wanted you to get from Elizabeth is, she did improve. And things w were done that either temporarily or more than temporarily helped her. <clears throat> but the Lyme ap literate approach is, is, is almost overly, I don't know if I want to say overly comprehensive, but it's not organized, I guess would be a better way of putting it. So there are people in here who've gone to the hypobaric chamber, they've gotten their teeth out, they've gotten heavy metals, they've been chelated, they've mm -hmm. done pulses, and every different type of procedure, but not particularly in the same way, and not particularly in an organized fashion. I, I, if my observations are correct, it's like we do something, we see how much better you get, and then when you hit the wall, we, we look for something else. And so, and that's what I went through uh, as a non-Lyme patient, uh, but, but but we I mean, I've heard a thousand Lyme consultations at this point in time. So that's something that, that really, uh, really uh, I wanted to bring out. So, so this was something that we had to kind of look at when we started having Lyme patients getting better. Like, okay, what are the underlying factors that are causing people to get better, but with, without us being able to nail down, which was it, which was it, which was it? And, and, and we started out with, uh, with, with understanding it was an immune response Duh. But then going back to all the things that uh, compromise that patient. Dr. Gates is going to get into this in great detail here in just a few minutes. So you get to, the, you get to a point where you were plateaued, which is, uh, as I understand, you st 
I, I was going to ask you, like, what made you feel that there was more that could be done? You, 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 and I will say this. Now, look, there's Lyme patients who get gotten better. They don't show up in here, mm -hmm. okay? So I'm not even saying that there are Lyme patients who never get better going through Lyme literate world. I'm not, okay? But I'm saying that it's almost accidental in, or the or Lyme uh, condition has been caught early enough to where it responds to the antibiotics. So, um, so but, but Liz has probably came in here in better shape than any Lyme patient that's ever walked in here, which is one of the reasons I wanted her to be here so we could present the fact that yes, there's Lyme, yes, we're not bashing all of the Lyme literate doctors, but we do believe that significant improvement can be made in the approach and, and the testing and these types of things. But she came in here in pretty good shape. In fact, if I recall correctly, you didn't come in here for Lyme. I didn't. I actually came in for my immune system. Right. So I had my Lyme literate doctor have a beautiful consult or a beautiful kind of final session with me. And he said, you are healthy, be free and fly. And um, I was like, great, okay, I'm gonna go live my life. Well, the hardest thing was is I have um, quite a few nieces and nephews and I would look at them and I would instantly be sick. So when I'm, I've spent four and a half years in bed, I haven't been working. I have slowly worked my way up to feeling comfortable enough to drive and have independence and cooking for myself. So I've gone on this long journey, but I, and I wanted to get a job. I wanted to get back into work and that was not a reality. So that's what I remember. You couldn't do it. Yeah. I, and she I, would crash. <laughs> I would be really frustrated because I'm like, my doctor tells me I'm healthy, but I cannot get a job anywhere because no one's going to hire somebody who works for a week and then is off for a week and works for a week and is off for a week. So I started Googling, of course, where I, I, every Lyme person can relate to just Googling everything. That became my very normal, comfortable situation. <laughs> um, and I found Power Health. Um, I actually think somebody sent me a link to you guys. And I saw that you did a lot on autoimmune, or not autoimmune, on the immune system. Right. And I was like, oh, that's what my problem is. My immune system is off. That's why I, can't, I keep getting cold or keep getting sick. So I'm going to go and seek them for help. I didn't know that I was coming here to resolve any of my Lyme things. I didn't know. I didn't think of my body as a whole person. I thought of my body as a systems approach. So my Lyme was dealt with, so I put that away. My heart was good. I put that away. My digestion was mediocre, but I didn't know that until coming through here. Um, so that was kind of my thoughts on it, I guess, or my okay. journey. And, 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 and the point that Elizabeth makes that is so salient is, is that it, it really, once the bacteria is not handled, you have usually developed an autoimmune problem. Now, Dr. Gates is going to go into that in a little greater length again. He said how there's some truth to that. It's immunosuppressant. But in the end, it's an autoimmune problem. It's been proven to be an autoimmune problem. There's research on it that came out a year ago uh, in, in, in February. There's other research that uh, talks about how the testing isn't correct because the testing isn't really testing for the right things. It's, it's testing for antibodies and, the, and, and Dr. Gates is gonna talk about that. So in the end, what we did find in the beginning when, when we had these patients getting better that we didn't know why they were getting better, we, we assumed they had autoimmune problems. While our autoimmune patients were compromised hosts when they had already been triggered. So we started to get into uh, into the history of, well, how were you beforehand? What, and, it, and, it, and it turns out that the system, a systems approach is what is the appropriate mm -hmm. approach to look at the whole body. And unfortunately, you kind of have to look at, fortunately, you kind of have to look at the whole body, what it looked like before the trigger, yeah. what it looked like after the trigger. And essentially, you have to handle all the things that were there before the trigger if you have any hopes of dampening whatever is left. Right, so can I go into my yes, case? Yes, absolutely. So, I was just gonna say, and I don't even remember what we diagnosed you with. And I don't remember if we diagnosed you with fibromyalgia or chronic stress responses or, but I, but I didn't look at the chart because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a model that we've developed and that it's a paradigm, it's in a logarithm that we apply to chronic pain. And, and I just know that Elizabeth was in the framework of that, so. So, so um, look, talking about the so whole body, <laughs> talking about treating the whole body. Before coming here and learning about functional medicine, I was under the paradigm of Western medicine, essentially, where you have a, everything is based on whatever part of the body is. So if you have a stomach issue, you see a gastro doctor. If you have this a heart issue, you see a cardiologist. 
And when I came in here, I started to learn that my body was compromised all the way around. So if I go back in my story, I know that I have had digestion problems as a baby. My baby book says um, extremely long periods without going to the bathroom. And so even at a very, very baby stage, my digestion did not work right. I had massive problems with elimination. And so then when I got thrown on all of these antibiotics, my body freaked out because it couldn't handle anything. I was gonna say, when Elizabeth said that I went and I got the antibiotics and everything got worse, I was gonna say that was diagnostic to me doing the interview and Dr. Gates will talk a little bit more about that. Right. So. Um, the other thing that I was told is during my Lyme treatment, you need to be gluten-free and dairy-free. And sugar-free was um, also emphasized, but not quite as much. So I'm like, okay, I can do that. I can be gluten-free and I can be dairy-free. If somebody gives me a rule, I'm going to do it. I'm going to follow that and because I want to get better. <laughs> yeah. And so I did. Um, and yet when I came in here and I tested my gut, my stomach and everything was so messed up right. because gluten-free and dairy-free were not the answer. It was figuring out what all of the foods right. that trigger my body. Right. It was what, what made you, what made you reactive to gluten and dairy, Right. you know, and, and I, and as a fibromyalgia patient, I'm convinced that my leaky gut started when I was five weeks old and I had uh, an intestinal surgery, which probably brought on a, a whole leaky gut and then later on I had ulcers at 15 and then I got mono and this whole thing worked up until I blew up at 48 and f with fibro and all. And that's what we find. Yeah. That's what we find. We find that that's, that's the model. You have to truly go back. Now I've been in practice since 1980 here in Reno. I've been in the profession for at least another five years uh, other than that. And forever I've heard, we're getting to the cause of the problem. But I knew that, and I was doing dietary stuff and then I wasn't, and I was doing supplements and I wasn't in addition to musculoskeletal work and, and, uh, and, and I background in human anatomy and biochemistry and physiology. So I always was playing with that to see why my patients weren't getting better. And yet I never felt like we were getting to the cause of the problem, mm -hmm. even though we were told that what we were doing by giving supplements and giving a person a blood sugar diet was getting to it. So the confusing part for those of you today, it's easy to sell diet, okay? Because it's diet and anybody can do it. And so it's very commercialized and, 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 and that's fine, okay? I mean, it's better that everybody's trying to eat a better diet than that they're not, but it's being sold as you get off of gluten, you get off of grains, the paleo diet, that's gonna do it. Then you take these supplements, that's gonna do it. But if you have a gluten sensitivity, that's just the tip of the iceberg. You probably have leaky gut, you probably have food sensitivities to other things, you may have autoimmunity. There, there's just a whole lot of other things that are gonna cause you to get off of gluten and not have a response or have a little re response in it, not be really what's going on. Again, I think you're gonna learn more about that in a few minutes. So we get here and, and, and we walk through this program. And, uh, and so, I mean, without sounding the way this is gonna sound. Like, how are you doing now? Yeah, um, I am doing fantastic. I never knew that I would have life outside of being stuck in my house and stuck in bed. I never, um, I was really afraid to always set goals. I think a lot of people with Lyme disease can relate to that there's always another shoe that's gonna drop out from under them. And that was my life for years. Um, and so any goal that I would set would be like a one day goal or a one week goal, because beyond that, I had no control and no thoughts of anything. And now I will tell you that I have made a complete 180. I am the happiest and healthiest I have ever been in my entire life. I, do, I wake up every morning and I don't identify as a Lyme patient. I identify as, yes, I have or had Lyme, and it controlled me, but I'm also a woman. I'm um, really excited about life. I enjoy hanging out with other people. There's so much more to me than just that disease. And so I don't wake up every morning being like, oh, what's my Lyme gonna do to me today? I just wake up and go and have a great day and never worry about my energy levels or how I'm gonna feel or what's gonna set me off. Um, I do prioritize my health. So I've learned a lot about managing my stress and about eating really well. But as long as I do those two things and I sleep, I'm like rock solid. So you have a maintenance program. I do. And it's and it's it's doable, right? Yeah. So I mean that was the goal. The goal was not just to get people and not everybody's going to get this response. Mm -hmm. Okay, just full disclosure. <laughs> okay. 
Elizabeth got this response for a lot of reasons. She got this response because she had already done a lot of things before she got here. She got this response because she did everything that she was asked to do. She got this response because she's an extremely positive person, and there's a lot of other reasons that she got this response. And that's what I'm evaluating in the beginning, because the point is we are treating you truly, mentally, physically, and spiritually, if you will, okay? okay? And so, so we get varying responses. Well, for the most part, our patients get substantially better. And the goal was to give patients a, 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 be able to help to give patients a protocol where less supplements are better, less drugs are better. We do brain rehabilitative exercises. We do find that chronic stress responses seem to be a big part of perpetuating gut problems, autoimmune problems, peripheral neuropathy problems, fatigue problems, things of that nature. I've had multiple concussions for my fibromyalgia, which who knows, maybe I got Lyme, maybe I don't. But, but my, my brain rehab exercises are like three to five minutes, and I do them twice a day, sometimes three times a day. So, so we've come up with a very doable paradigm because if you give, if, first of all, too many, too many drugs and too many supplements are not the best thing for, for, for an autoimmune patient, which if you have Lyme, as Dr. Gates is going to tell you, you're an autoimmune patient. And, and, and so, but, but it's also expensive. You know, so if you give, give people a, uh, a, a, a protocol that is, uh, you only have to take three supplements a day instead of 90, and you, or, and you only have to take, uh, uh, and, and you do some little brain, brain exercise, and everybody's in the brain exercise today, some of the programs online are like an hour and a half long. Uh, if you only have to do three to five minutes worth of brain exercises, if you just sleep, yeah, we usually figure out the diet. Their diet. Figuring out diet is very sophisticated. I, I'm not gonna get into that at this point in time. But it's not just going taking an allergy test and it's not just an allergy elimination test. There's more to it than that. So you got to get the diet right. And, um, and, and, and so you have to have less, less supplements, less drugs, uh, proper diet, and, and a doable brain rehab exercise. Mine's three to five mm -hmm. minutes, two, two to three times a day. I mean, I, I mean, I'd do it like I, if I'm feeling a little bit off, I might just start doing my, my exercises sitting right at my desk. So I guess one last thing. I don't want this segment to go too long. but. Um, but okay, so you did so you did that whole procedure, mm -hmm. and then you did uh, the procedure that we were developed, developing, developed here, and um, and you made the comment that you wish you would have done this one first. Okay, yeah. this is going to seem a little pre, but it it isn't. It's not. It's not meant to be. Okay, I just I think she can explain that better than anybody because she's the only person that's ever come in here who's completely. I mean, I should tell you. I mean, I should tell her to tell you how much you know she spent. But if you are a Lyme patient, you've probably spent a ton of money at this point in time. At least our average Lyme patient comes here and spends more money. I, I can't even believe how much money people spend before they get here. It's like I don't even. It, it's beyond my comprehension. But 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 you said you you, you did, and this was unprompted, truly. Uh, in, in that that you thought you wish you'd have been here first, and and and. So what was the difference? What was the difference? Yeah, so um, I alluded to it a little bit ago, but um, really what it comes down to it is I was, my body was not set up to handle the medications that my doctor put me on. I think that antibiotics have a really important role. I think that um, antiparasitics have a really important role in all of the Lyme thing that's going on. Big room. With everything that was happening in my gut, I had a massive parasite problem. So if I could go back and redo everything, I wish that I would have made my body stronger first before introducing anything that was going to kill anything mm -hmm. within my body. Mm -hmm. If my elimination was better, um, if my stress was more controlled, if I understood that the body is a whole system and not just like your arm doesn't operate separate than the rest of your body, it's all related. And if you have a stressful day or you have a rough relationship in your life, that's gonna impact how your healing takes place. So I was very fortunate. I had a great support system, um, which I know some people do and some people don't. And so having doctors who care about you or anyone who cares about you is important. Um, but I get, is there, am I missing anything? No, I've just, um, you had said you want to do this first and that brought up uh, the fact that we uh, uh, put together a paradigm that we use largely, even though we're not medical doctors, we are taught diagnosis as chiropractors, certainly functional neurologists, and as functional medicine practitioners. We use largely Western medicine diagnostics. Right. 
um, we use largely Eastern medicine or alternative treatment, but there's a time when medical treatment can be involved in many of the types of things that we take. So we do work with the medical community and usually get a lot of cooperation because when they see how we do our workups and they understand through uh, reports that we write that we do understand their world as well as our world, we, we do get a lot of cooperation there and we don't hesitate to combine that in a team effort if and when it's needed. Mm -hmm. So the last thing, so the last thing is this. So tell them what you do for uh, a living today. <laughs> so after going through this clinic and experiencing everything that functional medicine have, has to offer, I fell in love. Um, I, had, I felt like I had wasted five years of my life doing these IV antibiotics and all of this crazy treatment, what I knew to be true. Um, if I would have started with the functional medicine approach, I could have saved a lot of time off my life and saved a lot of money in general. Um, and so I went to school to become a functional medicine certified health coach. And with that, I partner with people to help them to walk this journey of what does it look like to find better relationships and change your diet. And um, basically the lifestyle things that you have control over, I walk with people and partner them through that. It's very complimentary to what's going on here. A lot of people right. just need right. additional support. And so right. with my training, that's what I've been able to learn how to do. Right, we're usually gonna figure out what's wrong, we're usually gonna have a good approach, but, the, but when I say that I'm evaluating people to determine whether they're a good candidate for this, part of it is are they gonna do what we need to do? Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of times the foods that go away are the foods that the person craves the most. There are other lifestyle changes, there's shopping, there's just a lot of complexities. When you have somebody who's already been through it, it's very valuable. Mm -hmm. If you wanna tell them, if you wanna tell them your, your, your data, you can. You want to give me your number or anything oh, like that? Okay. Um, I know they might be all over the mm -hmm. world, so they're not here in Reno, Nevada, sure. but if somebody's here in Reno and you want to tell them you know, how to contact you, that would be fine. Sure. So um, my website is elizabethgrim.com, and that's Grim with two M's. You can find me on Instagram or Facebook at Functional Medicine Coach, and um, those are the best ways to reach me. I'm, I work virtually, so I'm happy to work with anyone online. Oh, there you go. So... Now we're going to go to Dr. Gates. So we've told you how we got here. I think we've pre, I think we, that Elizabeth is pretty representative of the, of, of the vast majority of patients uh, that are watching this. And certainly she is totally representative of, of the vast majority of patients that come in here. Uh, we feel like it, maybe understand a little bit better where we're going with this. So now we're going to go to Dr. Gates and we're going, and Dr. Gates has done you know, I, I, I'll just say an enormous amount of research on this. Once we started to realize this was probably an autoimmune problem, we had already been delving into autoimmunity and how to, how to dampen immune responses without drugs, uh, largely without drugs. And, 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 and clearly we were succeeding and the research went on and on and on and on. And now we have a pretty solid paradigm. And, and this research is that he's going to walk through with you is uh, uh, largely responsible for us being able to fine tune a paradigm that we've been working on for, for quite some time now. And so we're gonna go in there. I think this is gonna answer a lot of your questions about Lyme disease, uh, the, what, what really causes it, um, uh, the testing, why it's deficient, um, or unreliable, whatever term you'd like to use, why, uh, and, 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 and what methods we're talking about and why they work. And, and, and I think you might be surprised at how uh, straightforward that, that they might seem to you, particularly if you've been through everything that Elizabeth got, was through before she got here. So let's go and uh, talk to Dr. Gates and, and have him uh, help us to understand uh, more about all of that. So now you know a little bit about uh, how we feel in general about Lyme, let's talk more now about the proverbial meat and potatoes of what we've come to understand is the Lyme conundrum. Uh, this is going to go more into specifics of why you're feeling the way you're feeling, why you've responded or not responded to different things, why there might be more efficient ways, but it all starts with understanding what you're dealing with. And one of the most controversial areas of the Lyme world is do I have it <laughs> or do I not have it? Right. So let's talk about the Lyme testing. And I did share with the, uh, them that I have fibromyalgia, but I've never been tested for Lyme, even though I'm from New Jersey and I would be picking ticks off. But one of the reasons I never was really 
motivated to is even from the time I started doing this, knowing a gentleman who was the president of the Lyme Literate Association for years. He, he was from here, he is from here in Reno. I never got the impression that there was solid left brained, you know, uh, data that I could grasp to really help me to understand whether I had it or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Lyme testing. Lyme testing. So again, this goes back to how so many of you are disenfranchised. <clears throat> Once you get into the Lyme literate world, many of you have watched documentaries, you talk in chat rooms about the testing procedures and how inaccurate they are and how most of you have been relegated to go to other specialized testing labs for validation of your illness. And one issue, and we're with you on that, so we're not pro CDC, we're not necessarily pro the Lyme literate way of testing, and we're gonna get to that. But we will say many of you are right in that assertion where it seems like so many people with Lyme disease are missed with these standard CDC criteria. We're not gonna go into the background about how the criteria got developed because I think that's probably been pretty well disseminated throughout the Lyme literate world and culture, so we don't need to do that. Validation of what most of you are thinking uh, came from a research article in 2015. It was uh, by the author Redman, and it was out of clinical rheumatology, and they took 104 patients who had erythema migrans rashes, most of you know what that is, the bullseye rash. They had, all these patients had symptoms of Lyme disease. And the researchers did serologic testing for CDC criteria um, before and after three weeks of doxycycline treatment. 39.4% of them did not fulfill the serological requirements for having Lyme disease. I think it's important that we just stop there and you kind of take that in. Basically, 40% of patients who have a bullseye rash do not have a positive CDC criteria for Lyme disease immediately before, like when they had the rash, nor after they're on antibiotics. That's a huge fundamental problem in the world of diagnosing Lyme disease. And for all of you out there who you know, who are searching for maybe statistics, that's a really good one to talk to your doctors about because there is this element of, I don't want to say arrogance, but many physicians say, well, if you don't have the blood test that's positive, then you don't have it. And that's really just not true because we're seeing that a lot of people who do present this way do have an issue. By the same token, by the end of this talk, we're going to get into immune suppression components of Lyme disease and how antibody testing for Lyme disease, whether you're using a specialized lab or whether you're using CDC criteria, is really just not accurate. And it's something that, in our opinion, needs to be basically abandoned in the future for those of you suffering with post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome, chronic Lyme, whatever name you want to put on it. I know a lot of those names are irritating to most of you, but Whatever name you want to say for someone who has persistent Lyme symptoms, antibody testing is not really the way to diagnose the issue. So that's kind of the story on testing. Okay. Yeah. So you, you, you kind of foreshadowed there uh, Lyme and immune suppression. Um, that seems to be the prevailing uh, thought mm -hmm. on, on, on how you approach Lyme disease. Uh, we discussed how we just kind of inadvertently tripped across Lyme patients getting better while we we're treating fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue and peripheropathy, and we were not treating anybody to suppress their immune system. Yeah, or boost their or, immune I mean, system. I'm sorry, to boost their yeah. immune system. Yeah, right. and that was a big problem uh, with a lot of people who were coming in here with two bags of supplements, and not only did they have a lot of sensitivities right. to those supplements, but a lot of the supplements were boosting an immune system that was already... Um, attacking them in many ways. So Lyme and immune suppression. Um, yeah, this is one that I've been corrected on many times by the patient sitting in front of me during the <laughs> consult. So this is a good topic. So this was spurned by a Dr. Stricker. Dr. Stricker, to my knowledge, used to practice or maybe still practices in San Francisco, California. He was the president of the ILADS Foundation and he uh, he took 73 patients and, with Lyme disease, basically, varying forms, varying stages, and he compared them to AIDS patients. And he looked at a certain type of cytokine called a natural killer cell. It's a CD57 count. 
and he found that the striking majority of them had suppression of this natural killer cell population versus controls and the AIDS patients. So AIDS patients did not have suppression of this natural killer cell, but Lyme patients did. So this was just a huge, huge, huge finding in the world of Lyme disease. Many of you are aware of it. If you've seen a Lyme letter at a doctor, most likely you've had a CD57 count performed. So then there's a gentleman by the name of Marquez, forgive me if I'm mispronouncing his name, he works at the NIH. So you could say he's more affiliated with the standard infectious disease model. And he took basically nine patients with Lyme disease, and I think there were 12 others who were maybe in the chronic form of it, 12 recovered uh, Lyme patients. And he basically said that there's no correlation between C low CD57 counts and Lyme disease. And then it was very interesting to watch this kind of unfold because then Dr. Stricker rebutted him and said that his statistics weren't good and he had a larger sample size. So that's kind of the background of the argument so that you know. Um, in reading the research, our clinical opinion is that Dr. Stricker had some pretty good findings there and it actually correlates very well with new research out of UC Davis. The lead author was Elsner. It was Plios Pathology in 2015. And I give you all these references because lots of times people want the information. You want to go look at it. So we'll have the references attached to the bottom of today's broadcast. And I'm giving you the journal article and the author most of the time in the year so that you can kind of go and pause the video and then go find the article if that's something you want to do. But also to understand that there's a body of work that's been put into what has been developed here, okay? So normally what I get, the next thing that you're going to talk to them about, they're going to come in and say to me, but they did this test over there at UC Davis, and that's the test you're yeah, talking about. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. And it shows this, and it shows that, and then the person clings to that. Right, rather than seeing that one the volume research. of information like you're rather saying. Than, exactly, rather than seeing the compendium of data that has been evaluated to come out, I mean, this is a scientific method, okay, to come out with, and to be able to, and actually to be able to understand how to evaluate research, which we feel we know how to evaluate research, because we're clinicians, we can, we, can, we can compare the research to what we see works and doesn't work in, in, in clinical experience by, by what we do. So, but I think that's important for you to, to go through mm -hmm. all this so they understand. We're not, we're not finding one piece of data that supports one, right. that one, right. one protocol that we want to do because we want to do it, okay, so. Completely, yeah, because we're trying to propose a new paradigm. And Hopefully I already told them we're not you, really only alternative, that 90, yeah. not 5% of what we do is alternative, but we work with the medical community mm -hmm. when the case dictates. And we use a lot of standard diagnosis. We use a lot of, and as I said, I, I, I already said uh, to them in, in our previous segment that we use largely standard diagnostics in all of our cases. Uh, which, which helps us to have a very good relationship with the medical community. But we use a largely non-medical treatment mm -hmm. in, in our treatment. So it's kind of right. interesting. And we use that's what the research and that's what our experience showed and that's what we do and, mm -hmm. and it's worked out pretty well. It has. Okay. So in this article out of UC Davis, it's a seminal finding where they dis discovered that when, well, really the background on the story is that they were seeing Lyme patients who could get reinfected with Lyme disease, which is just somewhat counterintuitive because typically if you get an infection, you become immune to it. That's the whole premise of vaccination, things like that. Whether you like vaccination or not, that's just the premise, okay. So how could it be possible that a Lyme patient gets Lyme disease three or four times in their life if they're out in the woods trekking around? So they started studying this and they found when individuals or if animals were infected with Borrelia, Burgdorferi, that they, the Borrelia species actually ruined germinal centers in their lymph nodes. So basically the long and the short of it is that the lymph nodes and your immune system is not able to make antibodies to the spirochetes. That's a big, big deal because the whole testing world is based on Lord. antibody testing, right. whether you're going with CDC criteria or a lot of the Lyme tests. And some of you are screaming at the computer or TV right now, well, there's DNA PCR testing. Yeah, there's that too, but that's not 100% sensitive and specific either. So this is really, really important because this definitively established, and that's a wonderful article for any of you who are scientifically minded who want to read it, because they really went through and showed how 
the host's immune system, the one that's infected with the Borrelia, is almost destroyed by the Borrelia species. Again, not incredibly new news for a lot of you, but again, we're trying to create the argument so that you understand where we're going with this. So that was very, very, very important. And I think that was the main topic there that I wanted to really hit. There's another piece. I think we should go into immunity at this point. It's just, it's just the point where you'll go into like the, 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 the um, molecular membrane. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Right. Yeah. So then we should go into that at that point. <laughs> so Lyme neuroborreliosis, is it really that? And again, just to reestablish, we are Lyme believers, okay? Unlike some people in the clinical research community and so on and so forth. We understand that Lyme exists. We understand that there are things that Lyme literate doctors do that are successful. We just feel like maybe this could be addressed in a much more efficient and frankly, probably a much more effective way, not just clinically, but cost effectively as well, I might add. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so just summarizing the go. point again, about 40% of people who actually have Lyme disease are gonna test negative gonna be via standard testing. It via the CDC criteria. Number two, now we're presenting information that really shows that even the more Lyme literate way of testing using antibody tests, which many of you have had done, in our opinion are not as, really as accurate either because this data out of UC Davis is showing that the body's ability to make antibodies is destroyed by the bacteria when it's in the lymph nodes. So your B cells don't function properly. So that's a big piece. So now we have this huge population of sick people out there who have Lyme disease who are told they don't have Lyme disease and they still have persistent symptoms and you feel relegated to take antibiotics. That's where we kind of want to put the brakes on and say we're not completely against antibiotics, but let's get into the immune component. So there was a Dr. Steer, he published a landmark article in 2001 where he basically came out and he was talking about molecular mimicry as it pertains to Borrelia and Lyme disease. So molecular mimicry refers to if the body is infected with a, an infectious agent, the immune system will make immune cells to that infectious agent. Think of them as immune missiles. And these immune missiles sometimes will then look like your own bodily tissues. So that's called molecular mimicry. And he saw that early in 2001 for something called human leukocyte. Uh, let me see here. Of course, I wouldn't have it right in front of me, but um, I'll come back to it later. But he found there was a correlation between this human protein I think it was L, FA1, and uh, Borrelia. Moving on, the article that we talked about in a big way was in 2016. It came out in the Journal of Autoimmunity. The author is Dr. Crowley, and they were looking at Lyme arthritis. Now, I always feel like I have to preface in the Lyme discussions because yes, I know a sure. lot of you have pre-existing notions, and a lot of you think that there's just been so much research just on Lyme arthritis and not on neuroborreliosis or those of you with just cognitive symptoms or widespread pain. But Lyme arthritis is just one model we can use to research what's actually going on in someone who has Lyme disease. And so with Lyme arthritis patients, they went in and they found that patients with chronic Lyme arthritis had B and T cell responses to matrix metalloproteinase 10 which is a really big finding. So MMP10 is a cartilaginous enzyme that we all have. But what they found is that there's an autoimmune response for those of you with chronic Lyme arthritis. This is important because many people with chronic Lyme arthritis think there's a persistent infection going on in the knee, for example. And they showed that's not really the case for the majority of you. That it's actually an autoimmune response to the cartilage in the knee. So that's a big, big, big deal. Also, um, other researchers started looking at the potentiality of you making immune cells to brain tissue. That came out in Brain Behavior Immunology in 2010. Also, the other key finding is that you have to understand with autoimmune disease, the immune system is like the military. One side is like the Marine Corps that does hand-to-hand -hand combat of a bacteria or virus. The other side is like the Air Force that does more precision killing of a bacteria and virus. And just like within the, Mil the Marine Corps and the Air Force, you have troops that are below the generals. And all those troops communicate to one another. 
And those troops within the immune system are called cytokines. So from a research standpoint and a clinical standpoint, you can measure cytokine levels to see is one side of the immune system out of balance or is there an inflammatory response. So it has been shown in Lyme patients that levels of interferon alpha are much higher than in control patients. That's really important because if you have these immune cells, these immune messengers that are really high all the time because you have an autoimmune problem, these immune cells can go into the brain and inflame your brain and not allow you to think as clearly, for you to have fatigue, for your cognition to be impaired. The example for someone who doesn't have Lyme disease is how do you feel when you have a cold? When you have a cold, lots of times people just feel a little sluggish, they feel fatigued, they feel depressed. The reason why they feel that way is because there's so much immune inflammation from these cytokines. These cytokines go into the brain and inflame the brain. But if you have a perpetual autoimmune response with Lyme disease, these same immune chemicals are going into your brain, creating a picture that you think is neuroborreliosis, which we'll get to, that probably isn't. It's just systemic autoimmunity. And that may be a piercing statement, and I'm not meaning it to be that way, but we want you to know the truth and to have the facts. And based on our current literature, these are the facts, and it's there. No, and this is what we important. see clinically. I mean, it's because yeah. the, I go back to saying the approach, I, what I just talked about a little earlier, was that the approach was to look for different things and try this, and then when this didn't work, go after that, go after the neuroborreliosis, go after the co-infections. I think this might be a spot to talk, to just talk about, we compromised hosts. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we briefly talked about how most compromised hosts, most people who get the Lyme symptoms are already compromised hosts. So the, thus the confusion, is, it, is this something we're gonna go into? Mm -hmm. Thus the confusion of all symptoms are Lyme. The, the, the lot of Lyme doctors are like all symptoms are Lyme. When all the symptoms are, the patient's usually already compromised with something that's gonna allow them to further develop autoimmunities or more often the patient's already got a low grade unknown or known autoimmunity to their thyroid or their cerebellum or their gut. Now you get this attack on your joints, this MMP, and then every time that gets attacked, whether it's the brain and they're calling it neuroborreliosis or whether it's the thyroid and you're getting all the, all the, all the symptoms of thyroid or whether it's a cerebellum and you're getting dizziness, vertigo and balance or whether it's a gut and you're getting celiac or whether it's all of those, Mm -hmm. You get the attack on here, all those blow up. That's what happens. That is what happens. I agree completely. And I grew up in a Lyme endemic area, and this is something that's always perplexed me because a lot of my family members, most of my friends, they all worked in the woods. And a lot of them didn't have didn't Lyme disease. I, yeah. And I'm sure that they, in retrospect, they were probably exposed to it. But their immune systems were different from somebody who goes out for a hike and you know their life has changed forever because they got bit by a, a baby nymph deer tick and so that's what we're trying to relate to you is that it's, it seems to really be an autoimmune issue going further came out in journal clinical infectious disease 2017 this year they demonstrated that most lyme patients have a striking Th1 dominance, which means the Marine Corps side of your immune system is vastly dominant. Generally, okay, so this immunology is a very complex subject. Generally, Th1 responses don't deal as much with antibody responses. So I already talked to you about how antibody responses are compromised in Lyme patients from UC Davis. So now they're coming out and they showed that Th1 cytokines, you should know that term by now, were 10 times higher in synovial fluid than in healthy controls. So 10 times higher, that's a really significant differentiation because lots of times these cytokines are just mildly high. So 10 times increase is very, very important. They also saw increases in something called a TH17 system, which is an inflammatory autoimmune type of immune cell. So lots of times when people develop autoimmunity, it's like the rogue dictator within your immune system takes over and keeps the inflammation going and doesn't want to let it stop. One of the biggest findings, and I think it's important to note, as Elizabeth talked to us about before, many of you have become so you know, upset with the fact that you feel that the research community is not on your side. You feel that maybe betrayed by some of our governmental agencies in terms of the research that needs to be done to figure out what your issues are. I certainly see your point on that, and I see, I understand the, the background of how we came about with the Lyme vaccination and how Lyme disease became more common in our society. 
But with that being said, there is actually a lot of good research being done too. One of the most just absolutely remarkable researchers that needs to be somewhat revered, in my opinion, in the Lyme world is a gentleman, and I cannot pronounce his name correctly. <laughs> He's from Johns Hopkins. You spell his name A-U-C-O-T-T-T. -T -T. You, you could presume it's Akot or Aukot or Akot, but um, He's from Johns Hopkins, and he has, he has discovered a seminal finding regarding cytokines and Lyme patients, and this is really, really important. So he took, he's done a lot of research that I'll get to on people who have post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome or whatever name you want to put on it, chronic Lyme, and the number of symptoms that they have. And he said, this is a real problem. He has other articles titled Lyme disease in her own backyard. And he talks about how so many physicians are not really even that aware of the nuances of Lyme disease. But going forward, he was involved in the study to my knowledge where I talked about how like 40% of individuals with a bullseye rash won't test positive with the standard blood testing. And so he said, we need an autoimmune marker that's more specific for Lyme disease. So he looked at 64 cytokines in a large sample size of Lyme patients. And he found that the one variable that's really high in all Lyme patients is something called CCL19. And just remember it now, I can't find that it's clinically available at this point, but I imagine in the next five years, this cytokine is gonna be available. And this will be one of the key diagnostic tests to figure out if you actually have chronic Lyme disease or not. So that is a big, big finding, CCL19. And still the, that home. the practicality of, of the research is this. <laughs> some mm -hmm. doctors don't know about it. Mm -hmm. Some doctors aren't going to know about it. It isn't like everybody gets the memo in the mail that says, look for this. Very true. Um, some doctors are, you know, pretty married to what they do. I'm be as polite as I can here. I mean, if you've done something over and over and over and over again for 20 years, sometimes it's a little hard to change. Sometimes the ego allows you to be a little bit resistant. And some doctors just aren't going to change to doing something that is going to possibly significantly reduce their income. I'm not being a jerk here, okay? I'm just telling <clears> you <throat> all, of the, all, of the, all of the human variables that come into why isn't this get out there? Why isn't it out there? We just blew up the paradigm when we decided, I mean, I was sick, well, several of us were sick. We just blow up the paradigm and said, look, we don't, we don't care if it's medical, it works, if it's alternative, that works. We don't care what it is. We just need to figure out what it is because we're all sick and, and everybody's telling us nothing can be done for it. We need counselors and all that type of stuff. And so we really, like we stated before, we use largely medical diagnosis. Dr. Gates' research clearly has pointed us in a direction. Um, well, you don't know that, but it clearly has pointed us in a direction that's working diagnostically, leading to creating paradigms that are working clinically and therapeutically. And that's why we're sitting here talking to you. So if we sound confident, we don't mean to sound cocky or anything like that. We're just telling you this is what, you know, this is what we see. And clinical results frequently are years ahead of the research or maybe, maybe 20 years ahead of when the, the research finally gets out there and is actually being used in a larger field of docs. So anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm with you 100%. Lyme and fibromyalgia, are we there? Lyme neuroborreliosis, so. Still sorry. there? We're here. I yeah, I never it. actually kind of went through that. I'm sorry. So I, no, 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 <laughs> or I gave you an out of order packet. So, okay. so many of you feel that you have Lyme neuroborreliosis, and this is an important point. And I, I'm not trying to irritate anybody, but we just want to be somewhat exact again in what we're saying. So there's a study out of Europe, is from Germany, European Journal of Neurology, 2011. They took 104 patients who had symptoms of neuroborreliosis. And they did a cerebrospinal fluid study, basically a spinal tap, as most of you would know. And they really only found that about six out of 95 had signs of neuroborreliosis. Now, there's two ways you can interpret this. One is that they were looking at antibodies. So again, antibody testing is not a good marker. So, we're, so maybe these individuals did have neuroborreliosis, but they didn't have antibodies. The other question is, do most patients who think they have neuroborreliosis actually just have, not just, but have autoimmune issues where cytokines go into the brain 
And then that creates all of your symptoms of cognitive difficulties, memory issues, fatigue, and that can also be part of your widespread pain. And I'll lead into that with fibromyalgia because there's an incredible overlap, as you can see, between those symptoms. And if you look at the 2010 American College of Rheumatology's guidelines on diagnosing fibromyalgia. But we get attacked on this. So because we do a lot of discussions on fibromyalgia and people attack us like we've never heard of Lyme disease before. And they'll say that, well, everybody with fibromyalgia really has Lyme disease. Any absolutes we find to be somewhat dangerous. It's not good to talk in absolutes because everybody's clinical situation is different. Have we seen fibromyalgia patients who have Lyme disease? Yes, we have. Have we seen a lot of fibromyalgia patients who didn't have Lyme disease? Yes, we have. And there's a Dr. Wormser. He did a study where he took 100 patients who had erythema migraines, rashes. They had the chronic symptoms of fatigue or brain fog or widespread pain or cognitive difficulties. And he found that one out of 100 actually matched the criteria for diagnosing fibromyalgia. Because just because you're depressed and you have IBS and you have fatigue and you have pain, that doesn't actually mean you have fibromyalgia. There is a specific criteria for diagnosing that. And we've seen a lot of patients who come into our clinic for these issues who think maybe they have fibromyalgia and they really don't. They have chronic fatigue or they have depression. Or we see a lot of people who do have fibromyalgia. And you can go back and watch our fibromyalgia broadcast because there's a tremendous overlap now in fibromyalgia, we're finding that it's mainly small fiber peripheral neuropathy for these patients who have horrible unrelenting pain, and some of you have that too. And then others have Hashimoto's thyroiditis where the immune system is killing the thyroid. Case in point, it's an autoimmune issue. When you get immune inflammation, it goes to the brain, can reduce blood flow to the brain, cause all of these side effects that we're talking about. So hopefully out of this you can see where we're going. And we start with the point that we're not on the CDC side, we're not on the Lyme literate medical doctor side. We are trying to say, there's an epidemic of you people out there, and I mean that so gently, there's an <laughs> epidemic of people out there who have chronic Lyme symptoms who are not getting better. And frankly, I feel that we need a better answer from a healthcare public health standpoint. Probably many of you would agree with that. Many of you are pleading with your Congress congressmen, congresswomen, representatives to do something about this. Well, there's research there now. And the research shows that the testing sucks on both sides. The antibody testing is probably not accurate, no matter how you interpret the tests. So that probably needs to be abandoned for chronic Lyme patients. And then we need to shift our focus that Lyme disease is an autoimmune problem. And when we brought it up in 2016, we got voracious, voraciously attacked. And the information and the literature has only mounted since then, basically supporting the notion that it's an autoimmune problem. And there are researchers out there who feel that what you have is real, and that it's a real problem, and that you are being pushed to the side, left without answers. So from all this, as you talked about, we found that it's stress is a huge piece to our chronic Lyme patients. Stress is maybe what's breaking down your blood-brain barrier, allowing all those cytokines to get in there when you have your immune inflammation, and the next thing you know, you got neuroborreliosis. Right. Talk going back to the compromised host. You're stressed, you had a concussion. And breaking down one's gastrointestinal barrier, yeah. which is where 70% of your immune system is. That's where most of your immune regulatory system is to try and keep your Th1 and Th2 system in balance. And then a lot of our patients talk about detoxing. You know, the Lyme patients want to detox. I can understand that if you've been on six years of antibiotics, for sure. Or if you have Borrelia and all the, the biofilms associated and the other associated inflammatory agents with this illness. From a detox perspective, what we found is that all the blood flow that goes to the liver is actually pretty much coming from your gut. So that's really the first place to start. And I know that Dr. Rutherford and Elizabeth talked about how gluten and dairy-free lots of times is not enough. You have to look at the right diet for the bacteria, the right diet for the food intolerances, the right diet for the intestinal lining, on top of all the other factors that go into healing that axis, as we refer to it. And then from a detox perspective, detoxing stressful relationships in your life, detoxing maybe what you're focusing on all the time, because we've seen a lot of Lyme patients where they focus on Lyme and focus on the negative circumstances and we try to help patients to shift their focus. And that's not us, you know, again, admonishing you, saying that you shouldn't 
what you're doing is wrong, we're just trying to help people. And we found that the stress response is so critical and the more you can get someone with chronic Lyme out of the stress response, or whatever name you want to put on it, the more successful they're going to be. And that's where the functional neurology And that's where the functional neurology really comes, comes in, in because we do a very that. detailed neurological as well as an eye movement exam because these eye movements are very well traced to different parts of the brain. And if we can excite parts of your frontal lobe that are not working to shut off these stress responses, we get results day in and day out of people where we haven't started any supplements, we've barely started the diet, and they say, man, I'm sleeping all of a sudden. Yeah. Could it be those exercises? Yeah. yeah. If you're in chronic fight flight, or like if you want to call it post-traumatic stress syndrome, if you've had emotional trauma, and your brain never stops, you can't go to sleep, you wake up, you can't go back to sleep, you know, you get anxiety for no reason, all panic attacks, and all that type of stuff. Your brain's flooding your entire system with stress hormones. You are not fixing your gut any for, for, for any length of time. You're not going to find out what your food sensitivities are. It, you're, you're not going to fix your adrenal glands. You're not going to figure out what your hormones are. It's not going to happen because this chronic response is sabotaging everything. And that's why the two disciplines married. We couldn't fix a gut in, functional, in the functional medicine world until, you know, suddenly someone's divorce was over <laughs> and, they, and, they, and they were able to get away from the chronic stress that they had. And, and in the functional medicine, in the functional neurology world, even the, the, the developer of it finally conceded that if your brain is like inflamed with cytokines and, and all that, that the, that, the, that the brain rehab isn't going to work that well. And that's kind of the gist of, 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 of our paradigm. Mm -hmm. it, it, is, it goes back to when Elizabeth talked in the previous segment on you really do. You have to look at the whole thing. You have to look at what was there beforehand. But I think... The stress response is like the key, the key, the first thing. It's like that doesn't, that doesn't get under control, preferably without Xanax, Prozac, benzodiazepines, even preferably with as few supplements as possible. And that's what the functional neurology world has figured out how to do. You don't get rid of that. Nothing you're doing is going to work as comprehensively as it would as long as it should. It's, it's, it's a big key. And who would think that? when a person comes in schooling me <laughs> on Borreliosis and all those types of things. It's, it's so, so that's why in the consult I said it, it's, it, it's important for me to help that person understand this is gonna to be a totally different paradigm. But, but I'm confident in it because we keep seeing consistently mm -hmm. successful mm -hmm. results and that's really the end product, the end, the end uh, kind of genesis of, of the confidence with which we speak. And this paradigm is supported by a lot of literature. Oh. It's supported by a lot of <laughs> clinical experience, things that we're finding. We hope in the next five years that Lyme becomes known as an autoimmune disease. We hope that the testing becomes widespread and clinically available so that people can get answers who have these issues so that they don't have to go through decades or many years of treatment still you know, burdened. And also, too, I think as Elizabeth pointed out, in that... Lyme disease should not be an affluent individual's illness, meaning only affluent people can afford to get treated for Lyme disease, meaning treatments that run over $100,000 and more. So that's what we're hoping, and we hope that you embrace this information. Maybe you need to think about it. Maybe you need to dissect it. Maybe you need to go back and look at the literature. Uh, I don't know if you had anything else you wanted to add. No, we, I think we just wrap it up right here. I'm with you. And so if, if you want to get evaluated, because a lot of people ask us that, you can go to the bottom of the screen. I believe it says powerhealthconsult.com. You can click there, and it takes you through all of the information on how we need to get your records, and we need a statement from you talking about your history so that we know what's gone on with your condition before we even consider having you come here to get treated, because we want to make sure that it's going to be worth your time, effort, and money if you're going to come here to get evaluated. So that's the story. We hope you appreciated this broadcast. We appreciate you watching and uh, hope you share it with your loved ones. And we'll be back next month with an exciting Cutting Through the BS series. Mm -hmm.